There we go. Good e evening, everyone, and welcome to today's California Association of Healthcare Leaders virtual panel discussion. Uh, my name is Stacy Kidd, and I am your session host from the National Offices of the American College of Healthcare Executives. I'm glad you're able to join us this evening. Um, there has been a lot of um, great response to our virtual programs, so we do appreciate your engagement. Um, before we get started, I would like to go over a few items to help navigate the program in our virtual environment. Following today's live session, you will need to log into the learning management system, um, housing today's virtual course, and complete the evaluation. Any handouts for the live session will be posted in the live session section in the course under the resources tab within the PATH learning management system. Today's session is worth 1.5 hours of face-to-face -face education credit. Credit will be applied to your ACHE account approximately two weeks following the end of the session based on your live session attendance and completion of the evaluation. At that point, you may view or print a certificate by navigating to the My Events section within ACHE.org and locating this course. If you are on the go during the session, please participate by using the Zoom app. Please also make sure the name you use for each Zoom session matches your registration. Each live session will be recorded and will be available within the course in the learning management system within 48 hours. While recordings are not eligible for face-to-face -face credit, you may view the recordings to claim qualified education credit, which are all self-reported. To receive credit, visit myache.org and navigate to My Education Credit to submit the request for self-reported credit. For the purposes of noise control, your lines will be muted for the duration of the session unless there is active discussion. If so, you may unmute yourself to talk. You will also have the opportunity to submit questions by typing your questions into the chat panel. Now allow me to introduce Jeff Logan. Take it over, Jeff. Jeff, I believe you are muted. How about now? Excellent, we can hear you. All right, perfect. Yeah, I wasn't sure. Thank you. Well, again, uh, welcome everyone. Um, I look forward to this session. Um, we've got some great panelists tonight. Um, I'd like to welcome you to our healthcare leaders, um, California Association of Healthcare Leaders uh, Collaborative Session Virtual Series 2020. Really great to see everyone here on our virtual screens. I know it's been a challenging time the last uh, six months for us all in healthcare, and thank you guys for everything that you're doing. Um, this is our third session in our series, um, but this is, I understand, our first face-to-face -face, uh, eligible credit session, so congratulations to our committee that put this on. Uh, my name is Jeff Logan. I am the co-chair for the Central Valley uh, Local Planning Chapter and a fellow of ACHE, so I look forward to these events. Um, just wanna thank everyone for taking the time this evening to collaborate with us as, form, uh, as we can join formal colleagues and a chance to create uh, some new friendships, to also take the time to innovate for a better tomorrow, and then to elevate for the quality of life in our communities. Um, today we have a topic on here we go. Well, I'm sorry, uh, September 10th is our next topic as effective management and morale. So I think that's a relevant topic as we navigate through this pandemic together. Also what we have um, coming up, yep, there's that September 10th. Register for that please. Tonight's session is 1.5 face-to-face uh, -face credit hours. So Make sure you fill out your evaluation that you will get in an email after this session. We also have the 2020 uh, Student Resource Fair coming up on August 29th. Our next slide. And I wanna put a special thank you to our platinum sponsors, University of Phoenix. Um, thank you, Rich, for your support in that. Uh, the Gurnick Academy, UCSF, and AYA Healthcare. Um, without their support and sponsorship, uh, we wouldn't be able to put on such great events like this. So thank you guys for that uh, sponsorship. Next slide. 
Um, this is also a campaign that we support the mask up, stop the spread of COVID. So um, I encourage you to go check that out, share uh, a post, puts a, a picture out there of you masked up and support your family and your loved ones because together we, we can uh, combat this and stop the spread. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our moderator, Sarah Khan. She's the CEO and principal of KIG Incorporated, which is a business strategy and transformation consulting firm. So Sarah, take it away. Hi everyone, thank you. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yes. Awesome, thank you. Well, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, each of the panelists, as well as myself as moderator, uh, we'll introduce ourselves and provide a bit of background so you can understand where we're coming from and what our career journeys have been. That way, perhaps you can direct some of your questions via chat to the panelists or myself. Before we do that, we wanted to take a quick poll to see who we have in the audience. I see some familiar faces out there, um, but let's get a let's get a pulse check here. Now, you'll be using your chat to respond to these questions. So poll number one, which category best describes your current career phase? And you can just pop in the letter that applies to you. I'm excited to see that our panelists are answering too. <laughs> Excellent, so we see mid-careerists, late careerists, and just a handful of perhaps students and early careerists, great. Thank you. How about the next question, Lavi? Question number two, same thing with the letters. What are you most interested in learning about today? See the answers slowing down a little bit. So it looks like really our, our winners are uh, professional growth and learning to differentiate oneself. We had a few people answer B and D as well. So career pivots and career advancement, right? Okay, last question. So other was a category F, which I didn't hear, I didn't see many any people, any folks respond to. Um, but if there are any other topics you're interested in hearing today, hearing about today, or challenges that you're facing in your professional development or career, maybe just take two or three words to describe what they might be. Resiliency and burnout. Thank you for Thank submitting you for this. to everyone. This way everyone can see what answers are coming through. Resiliency, burnout kind of ties to uncertainty, um, meaning we don't know what the, what the future will hold today. Yes. Successful networking. How do we leverage our social networks to advance our careers? Mm -hmm creative financial management in pi pandemic times. Now, do you, Kimberly and others who agree with her, do you mean personal financial management or financial management for your organization? Disruption of healthcare finance, healthcare industry. Okay, great. Uh, so feel free to continue sending your responses if you, if you have something to share. Um, and what we'll do though is just get started so that we're making the best use of our time together. Well, before we introduce our panelists, I'll take a couple of minutes to introduce myself so you know who you're talking to today. There. <laughs> Thanks, Navi. Um, my name is Sarah Khan. As uh, Jeff mentioned, 
Uh, I'm CEO and principal consultant of a company that I founded. It's a boutique consulting firm, and we specialize in business strategy and transformation consulting services. So I want to describe in just a couple of sentences my career path. Um, I grew up on the East Coast in Boston. Uh, my first job out of college was as in clinical research. I was a lab assistant at uh, Boston Medical Center, which then grew to clinical research coordinator. And that's how I got into my first real career, if you will, uh, working with the FDA. And I worked with the head of the FDA at the time, um, you know, based right in Boston, towards the country with Bernie Schwartz, who was leading the efforts around human subject protection back then. And it wasn't really until I moved to the West Coast that I needed to make a career transition. Um, moved for family and the opportunities available in health human subjects research protection just weren't, don't exist on the West Coast. So in Los Angeles, I went back to school, got my master's in public health at UCLA in health services management. Uh, and lovely that I got, was lucky enough to get a uh, administrative fellowship with Sutter Health, which brought me to the Bay Area. And I have not, not left since. At Sutter Health, I was in strategy and business development, uh, which was a great opportunity to look, see and learn how large scale initiatives are rolled out across a you know, very large organization, 21 hospitals. Um, and I got to work with some wonderful uh, healthcare leaders who are on the call today. So it's really great to see you all, John and others. Following that, I wanted to gain some operational experience and I left Sutter, went to Davida Dialysis, which is now called Davida Kidney Care, a for-profit, and I ran outpatient operations uh, in the West Bay, which was part of Marin County, San Francisco County, and San Mateo County um, ambulatory services, which and that was a great opportunity. Um, first time managing P&L, grew the business 26%, uh, non-acquired growth, improved outcomes from the bottom one third to number seven in the country, and um, found myself leading uh, new product development, go-to-market strategy, and launch for the Northwest US very quickly. Shortly thereafter, I was expecting my first child, and I decided that um, flying around the country was, was not that comfortable. So I, I left and started my own consulting firm, this one KIG five years ago. Had the opportunity to work with wonderful local organizations, which I love. And the last one I worked with was John Muir Health as a consultant. And uh, uh, shortly after my engagement, they internalized my entire team. So I became an employee for a few years and helped uh, transition from an internal consultant to um, outsourcing some of the administrative services at John Muir Health, became a part of Optum Health, as, uh, excuse me, Optum Insight as a result of that. And then I decided I needed to return back to my own consulting gig and I've returned back to my company. Here I am today. So we'll do a similar type of path for the remaining uh, for the panelists as well. Why don't we start with Mark? Now, Mark is, Mark Lisa is the CEO of Tenet Health Central Coast Hospitals too. However, he's had a really interesting career and I'm excited to hear him share that with you. Mark, take it away. Mark, I believe you're on mute. And that concludes my introduction. Yay. <laughs> One more time from the top. Yeah, okay. So it'll be considerably short. There's not much to talk about there. I, I uh, have been in the business for 41 years. A little bit of an unconventional route to the C-suite, I think, for some. Maybe for others, uh, they might think that there's hope. I... Uh, when I was in high school back in upstate New York, back in the 70s, I had um, grades enough to qualify me to enlist in the military. So that's what I did. Um, much, much to my dad's chagrin, I didn't go to the Naval Academy or Cornell. I uh, enlisted in the Navy. Well, 20 years later, I retired. I had, I had earned three degrees and I uh, had a commission as an officer midway through my career. 
I retired from the Navy 21 years ago, went to work for VHA Incorporated, which used to be the Volunteer Hospital Association. I don't know if they're still called that anymore. And um, I've, I've actually been in the uh, C-suite now for, uh, what is it, almost 18 years. My first CEO job was at a 14 bed critical access hospital in South Central Nebraska. The entire county was just about 6,000 people. And uh, I went there for that position from Yakima, Washington. And uh, so one of the lessons I hope that folks take away from tonight's session is if you always stay where you always are, you may always be what you are right now. Be willing to you know, look for opportunities wherever they exist and wherever they pop up because they will. So from, um, from Southeast, uh, South Central Nebraska, I went to become the uh, COO and uh, CEO of a hospital and a, the cancer center administrator of the hospital in Laredo, Texas on the border. And then a uh, tenant recruited me out of uh, South Texas. And, and the recruiter came down in August from Dallas to Laredo. I thought, I thought that was dedication. So uh, I, I thought, I thought if they're willing to do that and, and uh, relocate me to Manteca, California, I better take the job. So I did. I've actually been with Tenet for uh, 13 years now, almost 14 years. Been on the Central Coast here in San Luis Obispo County for the past eight. And I've been the market CEO uh, here for uh, almost three years. As market CEO, I'm responsible for two hospitals one in San Luis Obispo City proper, and then uh, one in Templeton, which is in the North County, unincorporated part of the county. I also have a strategic directional authority for a nonprofit physician foundation here locally, two outpatient urgent care, and two outpatient imaging centers that are operated by United Surgical Partners International, which is a, is a uh, company that Tenet owns and operates now. So uh, as Kim had said earlier, I was president of Cal. Uh, I don't know how long ago now, Kim. It was probably, what, 10 years ago, I think. And uh, so some of you may know me from way back then. And that's when we had started the local programming uh, groups throughout, Cal throughout Northern California. And uh, I wanted to get everything not so centric to the Bay Area. So um, again, a little bit of an unconventional uh, route to the C-suite. But uh, for the military folks that, that may be on, on the uh, seminar tonight, you know, it is possible. It depends on what you're looking for. And hopefully tonight's session will answer a lot of questions. And uh, I want to congratulate everybody anyway, because if you're looking for, uh, I got a note from Kevin, he's from the Air Force. If you're looking for opportunities and how to advance, doing stuff like this is exactly what you're supposed to be doing and then extend this out into networking and so forth. And so I would say congratulations, you're underway on at least the first step. Welcome, welcome this evening. Thank you, Mark. Kwame Liddell is on the line as well as one of our panelists. Currently, he's manager of hospital administrative services for Alameda Health System. Kwame, I'll let you introduce yourself properly. Hi, uh, first I'd like to say thank you all for for being here and having me here on, on this panel. Um, I think I, I have similarly have a unconventional journey. Um, I actually began, my, I, my journey began in healthcare um, for what I thought would be just a summer job. Um, my first year in college, um, it was, I was home for the summer and I was really contemplating whether I would even go back to school and I was, I got a role in EVS at uh, Loyola uh, University Medical Center in Maywood, Illinois, which is near where I grew up, near Chicago. And every, while I was there, um, the school had, the hospital had a medical school, nursing school, pharmacy. I, I just saw so many young people um, doing different things in healthcare. And every day, uh, almost every day, I sat outside of the hospital I mean, outside of the uh, cafeteria. And I would ask to have lunch with anyone who was willing to talk to me. And I got a chance to talk to radiologists, nurses, um, physicians, just all kinds of people and, and, and really got to hear their experiences in healthcare and what they were doing. 
And one day, um, one of the nurse managers called me into her office and um, I thought I was in trouble. <laughs> and uh, she, she actually, she noticed I began to ask people, she, she noticed the questions I was asking people and, and she really uh, helped me get insight into how hospitals function. And I, at the end of the summer, I changed my major to nursing and had an incredible experience. Um, from there, I had I was a, an ER nurse in a rural, small rural critical access hospital in Southern Illinois, kind of right where Southern Illinois meets Kentucky, and had a a really incredible experience, both learning in the clinical setting, as I found that later I learned that I learned the most in the emergency room um, in rural areas because you don't have all the all the resources that you have in the city. Um, and I was, I was exposed to so many populations um, that I wasn't familiar with. And it, it made me curious. And I, I wanted to learn how hospitals function. And since I had the opportunity, I had as a nurse, experience emergency nurse, I had the opportunity to become a travel nurse. So I began to take contracts at different hospitals in different areas. I went to for-profit hospitals. I went to non-profit hospitals and I, I got to see, uh, intentionally got to see different populations. And there was one experience um, where I worked at two hospitals that were, that were only about four or five miles away from each other. They were very close. And one was in a fairly wealthy community and one was in a uh, more disenfranchised community. And I, I saw if the firsthand experience, the care was night and day. Um, and when I asked questions about what was the difference, why was it so different, even though they were so close, um, they, I learned and the, the, the consistent answer was resources. They talked about operation and really the, all, the, all the, the pieces that impact healthcare um, that are outside of the direct patient care. And I, I wanted to help people. So I began to seek mentors. Actually, that first hospital, that rural critical access hospital, uh, the chief nursing officer, I reached out to her and asked her to be my mentor. And she's now the CEO there. And she helped me to begin to understand the dynamics of healthcare. And I chose to pursue a, juris, a dual juris doctorate, uh, which is a law degree, and a Master of Health Administration at St. Louis University. Um, and I was very strategic in making that decision. Uh, I chose to St. Louis University because um, it is and was the number one healthcare law school in the country and where, where I was able to focus to um, actually get a certificate in healthcare business and finance. Uh, although it, is, it was interesting for that to be your focus in law school, because um, we find that the future of healthcare is moving toward capitation and value-based mo and value-based models. And I learned that I, I really wanted to have a good understanding of that because in the future, uh, when I'm in the, those leadership roles and perhaps in a position where I need to negotiate those contracts, um, I I wanted to be able to understand them, and it, it really gave me a head start. Um, in following graduate school, actually, I'll talk just a little bit more there while I was in law school. The first summer, I interned at a fairly large um, corporate healthcare law firm. And we negotiated insurance contracts. We had large health systems clients and all those things. And being a nurse, I, I really had the opportunity to work at a high level. And, but I, in, in my experience, uh, I, it was a great opportunity to see that in, as an attorney, you aren't necessarily always on what some would consider the right side. Um, in, those, in that opportunity, I, I, in that experience, I found that I wanted to go into leadership because I wanted to drive positive change. And as an attorney, you don't always get an opportunity to do that. Um, and the following year, I uh, had the opportunity to intern at Johns Hopkins. And there I had an incredible experience where 
I always talk to interns and uh, people who get new experiences um, to talk about what you want to learn, really want to get out of it. And I asked to spend half of my time as a nursing leader with the nursing leadership team and the other half with the administrative operations team. Um, and from that, I gained the, I gained the knowledge to, that has really informed my career. Um, since from there, I became a, um, uh, administrative fellow at Dignity Health, where I had just some incredible experiences where I learned that the future of healthcare, even in with that, such, such a large system, I think in the future, the knowledge that leaders will need from a clinical perspective and a operational or finance perspective will merge even more closely than they are now. So from there, I requested, I, I worked to shape my fellowship around finance and operations, um, where I had the opportunity to get involved with strategy. And actually my, when, I, when, I talked to, when I talked to who was my preceptor at the time, uh, Mark Coyth was the president of the Northern California region. Um, my first role as a fellow was to um, be a, um, to lead our hospital MORs. Uh, um, and that led to a director of operations opportunity and now to the manager of administrative services. Thank you, that's great. Interesting journey. And last but not least, we have Rich Schultz, Program Manager of College of Health Professions, University of Phoenix, which is one of our platinum sponsors. Thank you for that, Rich. And Level 4 Executive Consultant for Roden and Fields. Rich, I'll turn it to you. Awesome. Thank you. And, you know, it's really interesting to be here. I'm very excited to be here tonight because, you know, there's such a diverse group of folks that are on the call tonight, and I think that you'll hear um, and have heard so far that everyone's career has always been a little bit different. There's, there's some traditionalists, and I think there's some folks like me that, that don't have a traditional pathway to where I ended up today. And so I like your thematic approach tonight for your topic, which is collaborate, innovate, and elevate. And I'd like to respond to that through most of the way that I approach my answers tonight in, in, in conversations. And I'll start out by just sharing some of my experiences. I started out uh, in high school working at a funeral home. And so, hence the black suit, I feel very comfortable in it. You know, I, I don't know, it's like a second clock to me perhaps. But I also thought about becoming a priest. And so, uh, working through high school, when I got ready to graduate, my high school counselor said, you know, I, I, I don't have the academic background because uh, I played I played around quite a bit and still do today, um, and don't really focus on academics. Interestingly, he said to me, "I should join the military." I took his advice because I was thinking about becoming a, a Navy SEAL like my father. And so, um, talking with my father, he said, "You know, Rich, we love you the way you are. I think you would really seriously change your personality if you went that career path." So he took me out of that that modality of thinking about joining the Navy. And um, he said, why don't you join the Air Force? I said, well, okay. So I joined the Air Force and I went in as an enlisted man and uh, became a dental assistant, became a dental hygienist, uh, taught dental assisting. And you'll see the, the commonality here. I dabbled in education, I dabbled in healthcare, and my entire career has been that way. And so became a dental superintendent, uh, continuously working on my education, about 18 years down the road, my father said, hey, you're about ready to uh, retire, aren't you? What are you going to do? So I went to the education office and said, hey, you've got about 160 credits. And I'm like, great, what does that mean? And they said, well, you just need 120 for a bachelor's degree. I said, give it to me. <laughs> uh, they said, no, you need to have a couple of classes that are focused in a certain area. So I signed up with Southern Illinois University, Carbondale, uh, finished up my bachelor's degree in workforce education and development. Uh, in about uh, 12 months. And then uh, shortly after that, about, oh, two or three months later, I retired from the Air Force, went into um, education as a curriculum developer, uh, worked in Washington State, 
didn't really find my calling there in, in that line of work. And so I went back to the VA and I said, hey, I need a master's degree. So I attended uh, Chapman University and my master's in health, health administration. And that's really where I found my passion. I loved education. All of my professors uh, really were my mentors. I'm still in touch with many of them today. And it was very interesting because Dr. Manny English saw my passion in teaching. And he said, I want you to teach my classes. I'll sit in the back of the classroom and you just teach the classes because your experience really um, brings that firsthand knowledge to the class. It takes whatever we can learn out of a book and really you have the application to it. So he would sit in the back of the classroom and I taught some of my master's classes. So that was really interesting. And he said, you know, you have a relationship with students and I think you would do well to go into, your, into a doctorate. Uh, and I said, so that's very interesting. Remember what I said, my high school counselor said, I don't have the academic background to go into college. That still resonates in the back of my head every single day that I go, hey, I'm Dr. Schultz. That's very interesting for me to say that because I never really took academics seriously. But then as soon as I got into my master's program, I discovered that I have a passion for education. And I figured out how I learn. And from there, I launched myself into my, my doctorate. My doctorate is in, in public health with a concentration in epidemiology. And my research topic is Alzheimer's disease. And so funny story, uh, my wife with uh, this whole thing happening with COVID-19 came to me one day in, in, a, in a state of happiness and joy. She said, I finally figured out what you do. You study diseases. And much to my chagrin, I said, yes, I study diseases. So she finally got it. And, and at that moment in time, I've become her biggest hero. She comes to me and says, hey, by the way, what do you think about this? And I'm always kind of dabbling in, in the latest and greatest uh, research that's going on with COVID-19 and all the different sides of conversations uh, that surround that. Um, to kind of talk about the University of Phoenix and how I ended up uh, getting into higher education, I started out uh, in a for-profit college oh, probably about eight years ago, um, formally and stayed with them for about eight years. And then this opportunity presented itself to become the chair for the College of Health Professions for the University of Phoenix. In my role, I supervise uh, about 178 faculty spread out the entire United States. Of that, we have a really diverse population of faculty. We have nearly 9,000 students enrolled in our undergraduate program. Most of them, surprisingly or not, are women. And I think that's very interesting because Today, I think with education being online and being very accessible, mothers, single parents, fathers, um, young adults have that opportunity to come to the University of Phoenix virtually, of course. We are the original online educators going back 43 years ago um, to all the different programs that we now offer. And so I would like to put a shout out just one more time uh, and I mentioned this to Jeff, and uh, shout out to Jeff. He and I work here in Central Valley. And so with the MHA program, we just earned our CAMI accreditation. And the CAMI accreditation is the Commission of Accreditation of Healthcare uh, Management Education. So it's a nice flagship uh, piece of accreditation to have. And I think for those of you that are thinking about elevating yourselves to a higher degree, you may consider um, checking us out. I think it would be very fortuitous. And I'm very proud of the work that we've done to really rehome, reskill, retool our MHA program. And then of course, I think when I um, think about collaboration, I think that for me to be able to collaborate with my, with my uh, faculty, uh, with my students, I'm constantly learning. And I think that that also helps me to help them innovate, bringing back uh, the lessons that I learned as an educator back into the work that I do. Um, I have probably taught, I don't know, hundreds of classes by now, uh, if not thousands. And what's really interesting is I don't have to do all the research on my own because I usually have about 30 students that are doing research on their own too to write and respond to their assignments. I get to read them all. So I have all of these handy tools of uh, constant reading and researching and keeping myself sharp on, on many different subjects. 
So I'm happy to be here tonight. I'm very excited for your questions and look forward to speaking with you tonight. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rich. Hey, Sarah. Yes. It's Mark. I just have to say, so with Rich and me, you have two Chapman University graduates on the panel tonight. I mean, you, I, okay. let's just end the panel right now. What more can we say? <laughs> I'll second that. <laughs> now we know the, the, <laughs> that's the critical success factor. That's right. <laughs> so I see we're still sharing slides. Maybe we can take those down and start having our conversation. And, um, you know, with these really um, detailed and really interesting introductions that you all heard today, we've covered quite a lot of ground already. So I want to dive right into what I heard or what I saw in our chat in response to the poll questions, um, topics that our audience is interested in. So again, we've got mid, late careerists interested in growth development. How do you progress? How do you get to the next level? And so my question to our panel is, how does one accelerate one's career trajectory? What does that look like? How do you get from middle management to executive leadership? And maybe we can start with Mark. I, I was really waiting to hear what Rich had to say, but uh, <laughs> so, so, you know, um, how do you accelerate your career tra trajectory? A long time ago in, in my other career, you know, probably when I was 17 or 18 years into my Navy career, I sat down and I wrote a strategic plan for my career. And I had some stated goals and I did a gap analysis and figured out, you know, it sounds, it sounds trite, but that's what I did. And uh, my goal, actually my main goal was, uh, I was, uh, I retired when I was 38 years old from the Navy. And uh, I remember one of my goals was by the time I'm 41, I'm gonna be a chief operating officer of a medium sized hospital or medical center. And I actually became a CEO of, of, uh, of my critical access hospital when I was 40 years old. And then two years later, I did become a CEO of a 180 bed hospital and the cancer center administrator in Laredo for UHS. But I, I think you have to, it's not by happenstance. You have to, you have to live and act with purpose in terms of your career. And you have to have a vision, just like we write strategic plans for work. And just like those strategic plans are living documents, they're, they're, I mean, they're, they're living uh, entities that they could be changed, uh, you know, market changes, market dynamics change and so forth. Your own career strategic plan cannot be ignored. It can't be written and put on a shelf and then you know, uh, you, you hope and pray that it comes true and, and hope is not a strategy. Uh, you have to work it. You have to, you have to review it. You have to live it. You have to understand where you are now, where you want to be and what is involved in getting there. Even if it's as simple, and I almost always advocate for this from people that are seeking career advice, even if it's as simple as networking and seeking courtesy interviews with other executives and, and seeking some mentorship or joining the ACHE Leadership Mentoring Network, all of those are creative and all of those are important. But it, again, it's not by happenstance. It, it has to be with purpose and you have to have the drive and energy to advance and succeed. When you get to where you're going, you, and you wonder how you got there. Well, it's because you applied everything that you had planned for way back when or at the beginning. Does that, I hope that resonates with some folks. And, and that's what I did. And you just have to have, you have to be willing to learn and, and, and so forth. And so there you go. That's my perspective. Hmm. That's great. I have heard of career strategic plans before, but I actually have never known anybody who Used them. So that's great. It is. It does actually work. That's wonderful. Chapman Rich, grad. So. I was just going to say, Rich, would you like to add anything? <laughs> Certainly. And, and I think that, you know, one thing that, that Mark spoke about that resonates with me is thinking about Stephen Covey and the Covey Institute. And I think if you think about going back and resharpening the saw, that really means, what that means to me is uh, you have to take a look at where you are today, develop a plan, 
of, of action of where you want to be in the future. And then once you arrive, you do need to go back and resharpen the saw and make sure that you have the tools and resources to continue the journey. The journey doesn't end when you arrive. It's just your starting point for the continuation of the journey. And I think that for myself, when I reflect back as a Chapman grad, I think about how, how I wanted to, to elevate myself to the next level. So I retired as a master sergeant, so an E7. So in the Navy, that would be the equivalent of a chief. And so I, I arrived at where I really wanted to be. And if I would have stuck around a little bit longer, I probably would have made senior chief or whatever else, right? Um, but that wasn't where I wanted to be. That was just the means. That was a stepping stone for the next leg of my journey. I had a career plan to be able to retire when I turned 38. So I did. And I remember at a campfire with my then wife, um, divorced, remarried, divorced, remarried. Anyways, it's another story for another day. <laughs> Um, like education, sometimes uh, relationships come and go. With that said, over a campfire, I made the announcement that I'm going to be retiring. And so I did. And it was really refreshing. To, it was like a, a, a very exciting moment because I knew that I was ready to go on to something else. And that other thing was to change from being in the military to starting my civilian life again. And I wanted to do that at an early age. And I think when you do your strategic planning, you have to think about your age, where you're at in life, and then are you, are you prepared? Do you have the tools? Have you brought the right tools to the game? And I think once you answer those questions, you prepare yourself for the next leg of the journey. And then I think that you need to go back once you arrive and say, okay, have I really, am I on track with that strategy? Or do I need to kind of up my game? And I think as Mark said, I think it always behooves you to have those courtesy interviews. I think coming to meetings like this and hearing from other leaders and just sharing your experiences, I think will help you prepare for that next leg on your journey. There are a few things you said that I, uh, Rich and Mark, that I wanna, I will circle back to. Um, Mark, you mentioned mentoring as part of your career strategy and growth. Can you talk a little bit more about mentoring, sponsorship, role models, and how all of that fits uh, into someone who's looking to progress and how can sure, they look resources? I, I sure can. You know, and of course, I started out being a, a good protege, and I sought mentoring. And, and uh, I had the pleasure of having worked for some really great bosses, and I also had the fortune for working for some not-so-good bosses. And... Um, of course, uh, great, great bosses and leaders and managers, you know, they, they're great be for obvious reasons. The, the not so great ones are, are you got to take advantage of that, too, because then you understand how you're not going to be when you become a manager and a leader. You understand, you know, what not to do, how, how, the, how the troops or the crew or the team really feels about you. And let me just say this before I go on. When you are in a leadership position, um, don't ever discount the amount of scrutiny you're getting for every word you say, every lifted eyebrow, every action you take. And so, uh, you know, if we get to it, I, I was going to talk about having, having um, well-defined values and being able to articulate those and, and leading by those and signaling that. But mentoring is important. So if you're a good protege, you'll, I think you'll be a really good mentor. And there's ways to seek that out formally through the ACHE process. And I like that because they provide a good skeletal framework, but also informally, things like... Uh, you know, and, and, and Kim and I have talked a lot before and, you know, things like just picking up the phone and calling somebody. The, the power of the network is so incredible and so awesome. We're not out here alone, but I will tell you in the healthcare community, we're not that big of a community. Even if you take in all 5,000 and, and uh, change acute care hospitals in the United States, it's still not a very big community. When I open up Becker's every week and read the list of, of names of people doing things, or when I look at healthcare executive, invariably, I know several people on those lists. So um, mentoring is very important. It's very important to pay that forward when you get a chance to do that. 
but establish a good mentor protege relationship. The ACT offers you that framework and you come to an agreement on what you'd like to achieve. And, and I will tell you in a lot of my, when I've been a mentor to folks, it never ends. Those folks will go on to the C-suite and even, you know, you know, become a, colleagues and sometimes they become, you know, bosses, um, you still have that relationship. So, you know, if you can communicate, you build trust. If you build trust, then you build a relationship. If you build a relationship, then you can build anything. You can, you can build business. And, you know, uh, I want everybody to keep that in mind that, that mentoring is so very important. The power of the network, you know, look at, look at Rich and I, uh, an affinity, look at, um, a lot of people uh, here tonight have been in or are in the military. There's an affinity and you can leverage that for that relationship and that mentoring. Thank you. Kwame, and I'm wondering, you've had an interesting career path as well and a lot of exposure. Have you, have you used mentors or worked with um, folks who've been your sponsors in organizations? How has that affected your career path? It's been, it's been incredible. Um, I, uh, a few things, something that Mark uh, mentioned was the, how small the network is. And when we, when you think about it, that's a, it can be a good thing and a bad thing. Um, <laughs> but in searching for mentors and uh, developing those relationships, it's a good thing in the sense that if you are interested and you get involved, um, it's created opportunities for me uh, personally, two of which be being while well, I was in graduate school as part of professional organizations led to internships and fellowships um, and actually also seeking mentors in my role in some of my roles, uh, getting involved in Cal and ACHE. Um, I see Kim, Kim's on the line. Uh, she, she was, she was my boss <laughs> in the past and, um, that's just keep, keeping those connections. And even as I grow and gain more responsibility and new, new roles, um, something that I've learned to do is get mentors involved. If I have new challenges, um, new projects, I, I really like to reach out to them and, and, and get their insight. Uh, not only does it further build our relationship, um, it gives us some guided discussion and gives you the opportunity to learn from them. That's great. Me personally, I can share my, my example as well, um, because sometimes you have a mentor when you're early in your career and you're um, sort of attached to them and maybe, you know, if you're lucky, they become a sponsor. And then that mentor retires and you find yourself in a bit of a vacuum <laughs> without a leader or someone to go to for advice and so forth. I've been lucky that my mentor um, never let me go, which was just incredible actually. And uh, I'll call out his name, Ed Burdick from Sutter Health was my mentor when I started uh, as the fellow in Sutter Health, right when I graduated from grad school. And we still talk every single every single month, even though he's retired and lives on the other coast in the US. And he is still doling out advice from his many, many years of experience and success. And um, for females, I think it's really important to have somebody who can also be a sponsor. Sponsorship for me has been um, probably the, the thing that led to my breaks, if you will when I shifted from being in strategy and business development as a manager, having not had any experience, and then took over operations for two and a half counties in dense counties in San Francisco, that was a big risk that someone had to take. And it was, it was my mentors who were um, endorsing you know, my abilities and so forth with my future bosses when reference checks were happening, actually. Um, when I was at Davida, uh, Davida Dialysis doing pretty well in operations, it was my immediate supervisors who sponsored me to take over the Northwest US having not had any of that type of experience in new product development or go to market strategy. I didn't even know what it was called at the time. 
Rich, I'm wondering, do you see that happening a lot with, uh, you know, any of your students or in your con consulting life, and in particular with women, and how does that work? Yeah, so um, for my consulting work that I do with Rodan and Fields as a level four executive consultant, uh, surprisingly, um, many people don't know this, but with Rodan and Fields, it's, pr it's principally women that, that are in Rodan and Fields. And so Rodan and Fields is the number one skincare company in the United States. It's a global company. Our largest team that my wife and I uh, work with happen to be in Australia. And so, um, the advice that I received when I was talking to my wife when she thought about joining Rodan and Fields, uh, speaking with her sponsor and her leaders, she said, her, her name is Marianne Benedetti. She said, you know, Rich, the best advice I can tell you is get out of your wife's way, start picking up the, the vacuum, start cooking dinner and taking care of all of her responsibilities. And I'm proud to say that I've embraced that. I mean, I've done that all along, but you know, from, from that perspective, um, you know, most of the women in Rodan and Fields are, I mean, I say most, they're all women, they're all wonderful. When I go to convention, uh, the first convention that I went to, there was maybe 50 guys. I was like an oddity. I had all these women fawning over me. They're like, oh, how did, can you talk to my husband? Oh, sure, why not, you know? And I go to convention today and there might be 3,000 out of 10,000 women, 3,000 men, maybe, and most of them are in the bars drinking or whatever. And you have all these really smart, educated, wonderful women from every single walk of life, um, every belief system, everything. I'm just different jobs that they've left to come and start their, their second career uh, with Rodan the Fields and skincare business. So I think what we're talking about now, as far as um, elevating and, and innovating and collaborating, uh, having a really awesome person to to pick you up and uh, lift you up, I think is important. But I think too, we have to think about, I think it was Thomas earlier on in the chat said something about servant leadership. I think we have to be really good followers before we can be good leaders. And I think you have to really embrace that philosophy from my perspective. If you're not a good follower, how can you heed the advice of those that are trying to lift you up? And to Mark's point, when you do arrive in that leadership position, all of the wonderful, wonderful lessons that you've learned, meaning that from those people that you don't want to emulate, you don't want to become, to those that have really lifted you up and you want to role model and say, I want to be like this person. I like their management style. I like their leadership style. I want to fly with the eagles and you are my eagle and I want to fly with, with the rest of the eagles that are here. And when I say that, I think that there's, you know, a philosophy that I share with my students. When you're at the top, it's very lonely. But when you look around, you're flying and soaring with eagles. Not everyone can be an eagle because they didn't do the hard work that you and I did. I want to just look at the chat real quick. There's a question to clarify the difference between mentors and sponsors. Um, I have a I have a definition I can share, but I'm wondering if any of you panelists want to chime in first. I actually, um, someone told me about uh, mentors and sponsors a few years ago, and there's actually a book called Forget a Mentor, Find a Sponsor uh, by Sylvia Hewlett. And um, a mentor is someone that you can have those discussions um, that don't nest that won't necessarily impact your your work. So if you are having things having um, issues that might be you might not know how to approach or uh, difficult pro projects or things that you feel you don't feel as comfortable about, um, someone that you can that you can have those conversations with. Um, a sponsor uh, generally is someone who can speak for you in rooms that you, where you are not present. Um, when those big projects are coming up and they're thinking about who can take on that role, someone that can give you the bit of confidence and uh, create opportunities for you. Exactly, great, thank you. Okay, I'm circling back to the comments that were shared earlier as well. Now, Mark, you had talked about 
utilizing your network. So how does one leverage your social network, your professional network for career growth and development? I would imagine at higher levels in organizations as large as yours, Tenet, it's really, that is how you become known. Is that true? Uh, part of it, I mean, you have to, you have to perform first and foremost, and you know, that, that, that goes a long way to getting your foot in the door. But, you know, um, I, I said, I think I said earlier before everybody came into the room um, that uh, I, I've been a member of ACHE since 1993 and I don't want any more. I was born after that joking. Um, but I've been, I've been a member of the organization a long time. And for those of us in the military, um, that was a great way for us to sort of enculturate into the private sector and learn more about that. I did have the good fortune and fortune for a year when I finished my master's degree and returned from a deployment on my, uh, on my second ship. I, I was on an aircraft carrier. We went to the Gulf and came back. I was up for transfer. Actually, I became a uh, postgraduate fellow at the American Hospital Association for a year. So I had a, a double great opportunity to meet a lot of great folks in Washington and Chicago and that I'm still in touch with and friends with today that, that were and are mentors. Um, but for you students out there or you early careerists, again, it's so essential. And, and don't just, it, it's fine in your own organizations, but I would strongly encourage you to swim in the waters outside of your, of your home turf. Um, you know, for you Sutter folks, call up, call up, cold call somebody from Dignity. Go on the uh, ACHE uh, directory, membership directory, and look again. Look for an affinity. Attend these things, and and you know, oh, if you ever attend a face-to-face -face session in person without a pocket full of business cards, you you might as well not have come because you know a little dramatic. But you know, always bring your cards with you. Be gregarious. I'm an introvert. I'm a natural introvert, if you can tell. And I will tell you, social distancing has been a blessing for people like me uh, because, I, you know, it's what I've always tried to practice. But um, you have to be a little bit gregarious. You have to be a little bit of a, of a, a person willing to step out of your comfort level and, and ask. And I've actually recommended and suggested to many people cold call or cold reach out to other executives and ask them if they'd be willing in return for you buying them lunch or a cup of coffee, if they'd be willing to sit with you and offer you career advice, that you're not looking for a job from them, that you just, you're looking for career advice. Um, Rich and Kwame, I, I bet, uh, and anybody in the room that's in the C-suite, I bet there's probably 99% of us in the C-suite that would be thrilled to get a contact like that and to, to sit down with somebody. We'd probably end up buying the coffee or the lunch anyway. But I think that uh, just like you need to be proactive writing your career strategic plan and working that plan, you need to be proactive in developing your network. It's not just going to happen. Any garden doesn't grow just because you have a bunch of seeds and you throw them out the window. You have to cultivate that. You have to go back out there. You have to make sure, you know, things are growing in the, where they're supposed to grow and that there's not other interferences or weeds growing in that garden. You got to cultivate it. So if you can cultivate a good mentor-protege relationship, you're probably going to be really good at cultivating great business relationships. And then from that will come, you know, even further performance. So it's kind of like an iterative loop that helps you grow. And I will tell you, having been a mentor many times, it has helped me a lot. It's helped me, you know, learn, you know, current perspectives on things, especially with younger folks and folks in or fresh out of school. Um, but it helps, lack of a better word, helps ground me a little bit too. And I really enjoy that. And I enjoy learning. I've actually gotten to hire a few folks that uh, I've mentored and that were interns of mine. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's beneficial both ways. Thank you. 
let's see. I want to check chat here. I know some some questions are coming through, and um, Navi or uh, excuse me, Shauna or Sachin, would you let me know if there are any questions that are pertinent to our discussion here? I see a lot of engagement happening, which is wonderful. I'm having a hard time tracking it though. And, and uh, feel yes. This, I think we had a question uh, for Rich regarding how, how is it uh, working in a, or for, I guess for your wife, working in a female run company? Um, how is it for her? She loves it. Um, <laughs> she left, interestingly enough, she left um, Staples and she left a very lucrative, uh, high six figure income to walk away from the stresses of working uh, probably 80 or 90 hours a week to now um, she's working about 15 hours a week, um, you know, a few hours a day. She goes out and has many petties back in the day before COVID-19. Um, and, and so I think it's amazing. I think, you know, it's a different, I would, I can't speak to her, what it feels like for her because I'm not a woman, but as her husband, I can say that our relationship is far better because we have that whole work-life balance. And so I apologize if you hear my dogs in the background. Um, it's, it's an amazing opportunity for her because she has an opportunity to collaborate. Uh, she can do everything that Mark spoke about. She can go out and, and talk to people in different levels. Uh, people look to her. She trains her team, um, which are all, all women. Um, I think that in our six years of business, we've had a couple of guys that tried the business. Um, hang on one second. Uh, and I have four, four dogs, they're all female, and I have a male cat who thinks he's a dog. <laughs> uh, so, and, and it's, it's dinner time for them, so they're just letting me know. Um, to, to make my point, um, I think that she loves working with all the women that she works with. She has a strong team of women that support her, and I think that's the whole thing. I think uh, from my limited perspective as a guy, I think women really lift women up. And I think that they will go out of their way to, to help each other. And I think that's the wonderful experience that we can learn from as guys. Um, I think we have shorter conversations, uh, but we do try to lift each other up when we can. But I think it comes more intuitive uh, for women. And I hope that doesn't sound sexist or misogynist or whatever else you want to, you could possibly label it as, but I think it's honest. I think it's, it's my perspective that, um, women do an amazing, phenomenal job of supporting each other. If I could segue over to a quick side note, <laughs> if I haven't lost anyone in the audience uh, with those last remarks, I would like to also say something that Mark spoke to just a second ago. I think that you have to draw a circle larger than you know five minutes from your house when you think about networking. It's not about convenience. It should be about where do you want to see yourself in your career path? If that means that the job is on the East Coast and you're living on the West Coast or vice versa, or in the middle of the state somewhere, and you have to leave your state or you have to drive two and a half hours like I did when I was working in Modesto. I lived in Modesto, California, and I would drive two and a half hours down to Fresno and then two and a half hours back home because I wanted to have the job that I have now. Um, so about two years ago, we moved down here to Clovis and I'm about 20 minutes away from the campus now. Yeah, that, that's it? true. I'm sorry. Go no, go ahead. Uh, similarly, I, um, did all my education and beginning, uh, working, work experience was in the Midwest. And, uh, when I be, when I transitioned to my fellowship at Dignity Health, um, even prior to that, I always i'd already began networking in ache and uh, nasi the national association for health services executives so when i transitioned here it was to my surprise that i already knew so many people in the california in the bay area um so uh it, when you talk when you think about um extending expand, expanding your reach uh professional organizations have been incredibly helpful in that especially in healthcare, uh, lots of leaders um, throughout their journey lead in diff various regions throughout the country. So it, it, it professional uh, organizations could be a great tool in doing that. 
That's great that you took advantage of that. I'll also say sometimes it's not possible to remain where you are or follow geographically where you need to go to advance your career as quickly as you want. And for me, you know, I'm, uh, I have very small kids right now, but I'm choosing to, I'm choosing, I'm choosing what to prioritize in my life. And for that reason, it makes sense for me to go back, you know, return back to independent consulting because it helps me gain balance and whatnot. Earlier in my career, uh, I also made a choice. I wanted to be close to family. So I left a very comfortable and um, probably what I would call, you know, my like ultimate desire was to have this career in human subjects protections, but it wasn't possible on the West Coast when I moved here for family. And that was, a, that was a decision that I had to make. I needed to pivot my career to something else that I could also find joy and passion in because I couldn't continue on that original path. And I have to say, actually, um, it was probably the best transition for me. And I am a lot more fulfilled and there's greater opportunity in this you know, broader um, business than simply clinical research administration. So sometimes it can be a double-edged sword but they're always positives. Okay, we received, we received a couple of questions about, uh, well, I'll broaden it. So the question is, how do we get more women into the C-suite? But I'll broaden it. How do we get to the C-suite? Can I take a stab at that? Of course, thanks Rich. Yeah, so I think, I think you just have to be prepared. And when I say be prepared, be prepared to step out of your comfort uh, zone. I think of Dr. Rodan and Fields. They're both females. They're both practicing dermatologists, and they're, they're they started their own company. They were they were told they would not be successful. They didn't believe it for a minute. And I think that's important to not always listen to that voice of of, of naysaying. I think you have to be confident in your own skill set. You have to be able to take a risk calculated risk, a research risk, and then go for it with your full gusto. And I think that it doesn't make a difference if you're male or female. I think that holds true for everyone. And I think that if you're not prepared, you shouldn't really blame yourself or others because you're not prepared and you didn't get the job that you wanted. I used to have a consulting company in uh, Washington State that I started. And it was called Net the Bottom Line. And the whole principle was to hire the best person that was best qualified. And it didn't make a difference. And to that day, I still hire the same way. I hire the best person based on their qualifications. I don't look at skin color. I don't look at sex. I don't look at anything else. I look at their resume. I bring them in for multiple res uh, interviews. And then the person that gets the job is the most prepared. So don't let anything else hold you back, ladies. Swing for the sky, swing for the moon, swing for the stars, shoot for the universe. You have everything that a male has. Now, to be fair, I think you are um, exactly the type of leader we need all around. And yet there are these biases that exist because it's not 50-50 in the executive suite it's not 50 50 in the board of directors tables at all and so so there is something that exists there we need to overcome now if i could just broaden the uh discussion a little bit beyond just women and talk about um diversity and inclusion how do we address the issue of diversity and inclusion creating greater opportunities for you know folks who are perhaps at a disadvantage or don't have the opportunities that we have and, and if we are one of those folks affected um, by this, how do we overcome that? How about, how about Mark or, actually, feel free to please chime in. Yeah, I can address a little bit of that. And, um, you know, I think first of all, one of the base issues is that when most people think of hospitals and, well, when most people think of healthcare, what do they think of? Hospitals. When most people think of hospitals, what do they think of? Doctors and nurses. And so I think uh, there's sort of a natural uh, misunderstanding or misconception about 
healthcare and all of the many careers that are available. I think what we have to do as leaders and, and in the C-suite, we have the power to do so. We need to be proactive in reaching out and starting in high school and, and colleges. And we need to be proactive about arranging for, you know, if there's a, a local uh, ROP program uh, or a local, you know, health careers program or something like that, we have to be proactive ourselves and get out there and make sure that we're getting students in to take a look at the guts of the hospital in my case and understand that it's not just doctors and nurses it's the majority is everybody else and that yes um, you can do anything you want uh, I, i've had the pleasure of almost always working in organizations that are meritocracies starting with the u.s navy uh, you know everybody no matter what you were everybody was haze gray which is the name of the paint color that they paint Navy ships. Um, again, that sounds trite, but you know what? It was based on ability. And actually for, for you military folks in the room, I don't know if you know this, but a lot of military officer promotion boards now are moving away from showing pictures of the candidates and they're just going by record alone. So they're blinding anything that could point to any categorical sectioning of the candidates and, and that's what we need to do but we need to reach out we need to make sure that we're getting these students but while they're still in in the high school age into our hospitals looking around we need to be proactive in creating opportunities and you know i think that nasi does a great job of that i think uh, you know under tom dolan's watch many years ago they created some internships minority internships the american hospital association did the same thing and i actually had um, one of their interns, uh, Emily Gander, and she's Emily Wadwalla now. She's one of the big bond rating folks at Fitch. Um, she interned for me for a while in Nebraska. She went to Creighton. So part of it is on us uh, as leaders to get out there to plow aside any roadblocks to those opportunities and then be proactive about it. And at the same time, we have to be very careful about how we're mentoring, how we're creating those opportunities. But I, I'm a staunch believer in, um, in, in meritocracy. Uh, but I, I also believe that everybody needs to be at the same starting block or everybody ought to be given the opportunity to be at the same starting block. Now, we all know, let's say equal opportunity doesn't mean equal result, but the equal opportunity has to be created as leaders, we have the position and authority to make sure that happens. Thanks. Can I add to that? Oh yeah, please, absolutely. This will be our, our last you know, discussion question and then we'll do closing remarks. Sounds good, I'll make it short. Uh, it's more of a rhetorical question and I would, I would pose the question this way. What are each of us, each of you doing to be a good sponsor? And when I say that, I want you to think about what you're doing to lift those people up that you supervise, you mentor, you lead each day to get them ready for the next great opportunity. Yeah, I had an experience at Dignity Health where um, the organization is intentional about identifying growth for minorities, particularly be when they have hospitals that uh, where the leadership, it looks so different in demographic, whether it be race, economic, um, socioeconomic background, um, ethnicity, um, to the patients that we serve. And uh, one thing that that organization did consistently was ask the executive team to reflect and think about people within the organization, think about the growth and hiring practices that, that we've done and if there are no lead, if there, if your group, if your team is not diverse, then think about within your team and why not? Uh, what is it? What are what what barriers might we be creating within the organization that could um, limit growth for for groups that are not homogenous uh, within our our traditional culture, and and really think about creating spaces. Um, so that people can continue to grow. 
uh, just a clarification. Um, I think this will be real quick, so I don't want to leave any questions in the chat here. Rich, you referenced hiring people based on uh, preparedness, regardless of you know characteristics and and such. Would you agree more broadly that you'd prioritize preparedness? That you would pr uh, prioritize preparedness, typically synonymous with experience, or would you hire for potential and or prioritize a candidate with a higher potential in the role? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I look at experience and how that experience applies to the job and the qualifications that we've listed for hire. So whoever most closely matches or aligns to, not only on paper, but also during their interviews, because I can ask the question, so here's what I'm looking to uh, have you do if you're the candidate that we select. Can you speak to those experiences that you bring to the table? And so I bring in different people during the interview, during multiple interviews, so that they can get a chance to meet the people that they're going to be working with. So it's a collective experience when I do the interview. Mark, you wanted to say a couple of words? Yeah, I would say, uh, you have to, it's a balance for me sometimes. And um, sometimes I've taken a chance and gone with my gut and I've traded a few things for, you know, preparedness. Uh, um, I, when I interview, it's very informal for me at my level. I let them jump through the hoops with everybody else. And my A teams always do panel interviews, but then they come to me and it's a relaxed, informal conversation. And I'm looking for a, a dynamic. I'm looking for um, uh, chemistry. Um, and I will, I will take a chance on some, but I, I'm really thinking a lot about potential and, and so forth. So every case, uh, kudos to Rich for being very rigid on how he does that. And, and that we, you know, we've done that with a sort of a medical money ball thing too. But uh, for me, there's some other things that I throw in there as well. And, you know, I'll be honest with you. I have made some uh, director and executive hiring uh, mistakes and uh, uh, a few were unpleasant. And uh, so I learned each time and, uh, and hope to do better. And, uh, and right now I, I, I love both. I have, two different A teams and some of them are combined, but I love every single one of them and I love them together. They just do fantastic things and make the old man look really good. So I'm happy to do that. Great, thank you. We are, we are at that time when we should really uh, close up our discussion. And what I'd like to do is just offer you each about one and a half minutes. So let's just go for one minute uh, to present your closing remarks or any words of wisdom you'd like to share. But I also have two questions we didn't address early on that, that um, we had intended to, if you could weave those in. What is next for you in your careers? And how do you measure success in your life slash career? Mark, would you like to start? You ready? Uh, sure. So let me start by measuring success because I actually wrote down uh, the answers that I have here. Uh, and then I'll go into the, the whatever I'd like to do afterwards. So um, uh, I measure success many different ways, some formal, some not. So um, important to me as, as a leader, let alone a healthcare administrator, has been the number of leaders I have and am, um, I have mentored and am mentoring right now. And I'm, I track those that have gone on to other C-suite jobs and, uh, and uh, become executives otherwise in, in other companies. Um, not only that, those that have sought and obtained undergraduate and graduate education, and, and a lot of nurses actually come to me for mentorship, and then they come to me for, when they get in school, they come to me for, because they have to interview a, an administrator or somebody in executive leadership. So um, I work in an area where the majority of nurses are ADNs. We have one nursing school here, it's a community college. Great school, 100% pass rate on their board, but invariably, I, I, you know, suggest to all of our nurses that they seek higher education, complete the bridge program, get their BSN, and then consider master's degree, MHA, MBA, MPH, etc. And uh, because we we grow our own leaders too, so 
I measure my success by the folks that I get to reach out and touch and help along the way. Nice. And, um, you know, that's very rewarding to me. For, for me personally, I'm a believer in lifelong learning. And, and I like to measure my own success by, you know, the goals that I set for myself and achieve them. Hanging on the wall behind me is a copy of my private pilot certificate with an instrument rating endorsement. And, uh, you know, hey, if I can do that, man, I can do anything because that was one of the hardest things I've ever done. And I've had doctors tell me the same thing. What am I going to do after I retire? Well, I would really like to pick up some interim uh, CEO work uh, around the West, you know, Western United States to just stay in, involved in healthcare and leadership. Um, if I don't do that, then I'd like to um, go uh, happily into doing a lot of other things. I haven't quite figured them out yet. So, um, but I, I'm a kind of guy I can live anywhere and be happy doing anything. So. I'm satisfied with that. I'd like to be a merchant sailor, actually, and go on the container ships. So, <laughs> who knows? That's great. Thank you. Kwame, we haven't heard from you in a while. <laughs> um, what's next for me? Uh, I am on a pretty, in leadership, I'm on a pretty steep trajectory. I currently lead um, administration and the clinical dyad for um, our entire hospital, for all of our nursing units and a few service lines. Um, and I am, what was next for me would be, I was the director of operations where I was on a track that would be COO. And now I'm manager of administration, which is nursing. Um, and I'm on a track for CNO. And I believe as I see more hospitals develop those CNO, COO roles, uh, prepare myself for one of those. Um, I define success in reaching those hard goals, those, and you talk about the hard skills, the managing productivity, all those things to, that we have to do to be successful in a hospital. Uh, but also um, something I, I, I played sports in college and something I really pay attention to is morale and the communication and building the team. Um, if we're being successful and everyone's unhappy, um, I, I, I really think about and developing a, the kind of leader and the teams that I want to want to uh, lead in developing that strong team and the communication. Thank you. Rich, last, last but not least. Thank you. So what's next? Uh, retirement. So when I look at retirement, I'm looking at probably the next two to five years, uh, settling down in my house in Lake Tahoe um, and spending a lot of time with my grandson. And if they decide to expand their family, uh, whatever children that they are able to bear, spending time with them. Um, hopefully reconnecting with my son who happens to be in the Navy and uh, spending time with family. So when I think about career, um, as I wind down mine, as an educator, I'm trying to prepare the future so that when I do step aside, that I have done my due diligence to prepare my students for their entry level careers, their pathways to uh, working with all of you. It doesn't sound sad to me. It sounds actually very exciting uh, in the sense that uh, when I look at how do I measure my success, uh, when students look me up down the road and they do frequently for letters of recommendation to the programs that they're trying to get into and they remember how we actually um, were able to communicate and, and how I mentored them during the short time that I had with them. Um, that's how I measure my success. The success of my faculty, um, when I look at graduation, when I go to commencement ceremonies, I get to shake the hands of hundreds of students that have completed their, their uh, associate degree, their bachelor's degree, their master's degree, and to be able to hood my master's students, my master's students, uh, to shake the hands of all my doctoral students. I measure success one student at a time. It sounds kind of Merrill Lynch or whoever coined that phrase. How do you, you know, we measure one, one customer at a time. I measure my success one student at a time on graduation day. Um, being in higher education and being in my role has been very exciting. I'm looking forward to the next phase I will close with this parting piece of advice, and that is 
when I look at all the CEOs and, and, and the C-suite folks that I work with and talk with on a very daily basis, the common theme is their ability to communicate. And as Mark said, have a sense of personality. Let your personality shine through because it's not your business card that they're gonna remember. It's gonna be that really great smile. And ladies, uh, you have that voice and be confident and project yourself in a way that you know you can. Thank you for being here tonight and I appreciate your time. What about you, Sarah? Right, I knew you were gonna ask actually. <laughs> Um, I am, I'm actually in a similar boat, uh, as an independent consultant working with clients one-on-one, -on -one, making, making the sales one-on-one, -on -one, finding out what their pain points are and trying to resolve them one-on-one -on -one. as a small business. It really has to be, um, my measure of success is my client's success. And it's some people, you know, sort of look at the financial side of it from a con when you're a consultant and. Um, that just is not fulfilling for me right now. What's fulfilling for me is contributing to the community. I think we're in a time of great need where there are a lot of people looking for connection because they're remote or because now they're unemployed involuntarily or voluntarily. And, um, that's why I've ramped up my volunteering at Cal, um, because I am feeling a lot of, uh, fulfillment from, from doing this actually. So thank you for the opportunity. And uh, what's next for me is um, as soon as the air clears and we are able to, you know, mingle and meet, uh, the first thing I want to do is go give someone a hug. <laughs> <laughs> that is it for our discussion today. I don't see any other questions in the chat and we're nearing the um, bottom of the hour. So I will turn it over to you, Jeff, to wrap us up and take us home. All right. Well, I just have a couple of closing remarks. One is, wow, what a great uh, session this evening. I want to thank our panelists, Mark, for your wisdom and insights and, and your, your history on what you've done and what you've accomplished. Rich, for some of your great stories and, and your passion to help women succeed, because I know as a father of two young ladies, um, I, I'm really cognizant of you know what they're going to do and how they're going to conquer their careers Absolutely. and then also uh, Kwame for, for your uh, background and diversity and what you've done and, and how you're climbing that corporate ladder so again great job and great insights for you guys sharing that this evening and for Sarah for doing a great job moderating this session um, a lot of good questions and great job facilitating this uh, virtual session um, you know, we want to leave you guys with a call to action. You know, think about what you heard tonight, uh, especially you guys that are mid in your careers. You know, I, I put myself in that same category. You know, so think about a couple of things that you can really start applying next week and the next 30 days. You know, we heard a lot about, you know, draft your strategic plan. What does that look like for you? Where do you see yourself? Um, it, you know, I, like I tell people when I'm doing some mentoring, you know, within my own team and outside of my team, it's, you know, look at that path and it's okay to deviate from that path because you're going to learn something from it. You know, put yourself out there and build your network. Um, you know, for us, for those that are introverts, you know, I, I tell myself and I, and I tell my colleagues, you know, get comfortable with uncomfortableness. You have to put yourself out there. You have to build that network. And for a lot of us being, in, being a part of Cal, I think probably 80% of us could say that, you know, our career that we're in now or that job we hold was because of the relationships and the network that we built within Cal. So, um, you know, if you have other colleagues that, that are thinking about joining ACHE, you know, um, that, that was one of the things that I did. And I remember one of my first sessions was here in Fresno and the president at the time, who's a panelist today, Mark, he drove from Modesto on his motorcycle to uh, lead that uh, networking event, and it's really uh, he was one of the one of the reasons I you know, joined ACHE because I wanted to you know expand my network. So again, you know, I throw down that challenge to you to to, to take part in this uh, call to action and um, you know set some goals for yourself. A couple other reminders. Again, this uh, session will be recorded, so if you have some colleagues that missed it, you know, encourage them to go on to ACHE and, and 
find the event, it'll be recorded there for you. Um, our next event is managing for morale. Um, you know, I think we're in some challenging times and, you know, the, the sense of isolation and lack of community, this will, will be a really good topic. Um, I know being a quality director for a 1,200 bed facility here in Fresno, morale's uh, becoming a challenge right now because we're getting tired and we're trying to take care of each other. We're trying to take care of our families and, and it's somewhat of a challenge. So I'm looking forward to that session. Um, one other thing, just want to thank our sponsors again for your sponsorships and support again because without you we couldn't make a great program like this so um, with that I want to again thank you everyone it was a great event we had over 50 people on our session this evening so uh, I want to say wow again so with that I'll turn it back over to Stacy. Thank you Jeff on behalf of ACG I want to thank our panelists and everyone for your participation today um, this concludes the session um, please navigate back to the LMS to complete the program evaluation. The recording will be posted within 48 hours of the session. Um, handouts are located in the resources tab in the live session of the section of the learning management system. Your face-to-face -face credits will be posted to your account approximately two weeks following the session. Um, today's program is copyrighted in 2020 by the American College of Healthcare Executives. All rights are reserved. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening. Thanks.